sensors. Um, the talent has to have a way to see and understand what's going on if you're going to close the loop. It needs some eyes. And we're going to do that with encoders. I'm going to go through this pretty quick. There's a lot of information on the internet if you want to go and do a little bit of deeper work and understand how this stuff works. There are quadrature encoders. These tend to do RPM and position. Analog encoders, you can also do RPM and position, turn it into a string potentiometer. Limit switches, we talked about, you can feed those in. You can also, into a talent, feed DC voltage and measure it. There is a 10-bit A to D in there, and you can feed that in and ask the talent, what is that voltage? It'll measure frequency, duty cycle, and period. So all those things can be measured by the talent through that port, and you can ask through the API, what is that? Encoders, briefly. Quadrature encoders. This is what a lot of systems use, robots and such, to keep track of something rotating. At the end of the day, a quadrature coder will tell you two things. How fast am I going, and what direction am I going? Now, you could say, well, for speed, I could just have a light and a little thingy that goes by, and every pulse, I do the speed. But I can't tell forward or back. It all looks the same. So with quadrature, what you have are two sensors side by side, and they each see the leading edge of what's coming by, depending on what way it's going. I've got an animated graphic that will show that. There's a lot of stuff on this slide that talks through all the different waveforms and what's going on. Go on Google, look up how does a quadrature encoder work, and spend a half hour studying it. Um, at the end of the day, this is what's going on. I have two sensors, could be magnetic, could be optical, could be a mechanical switch, and as my event comes by, could be a black line on an optical encoder, could be a magnetic field and a magnetic thing, sensor one sees it and goes high, then sensor two sees it and goes high, and quadrature means they are a quarter of the cycle overlapped. So if I go back here, what's actually happening when that point goes by, the first sensor picks it up. Halfway through that, the second sensor picks it up. Halfway through this one, the first sensor loses it. Halfway through that, the second sensor loses it, and it all starts over. The reason you do this is if you get speed tachometer, you can also tell if it changes directions. There's a way to watch that sequence and know I stopped and I took off the other direction. That's why you have the two channels in quadrature versus a single channel. So poof, there you go. That's the waveform that's coming out of there. There is a SIM coder for about 40 bucks available. That thing bolts right on top of the SIM. There is a magnetic wheel that has got magnetic polarization on here, and there's 20 fields on there. There are magnetic sensors in the circuit board in here, and that field is going by two of those magnetic sensors. And indeed, you get 20 full cycles or 80 edges. And on quadrature, a full cycle is what's in the blue line. That one goes high and low, that one goes high and low, that's a full cycle. A pulse is each edge, one, two, three, four. There are four pulses in a cycle. Very important to keep track of that, otherwise your ratios will be off by four. The talent counts every cycle when you feed a quadrature into it. So when you watch the register count, the talent register, whoops, is counting every one of these. So when you look up a SIM coder, it says 20 cycles per revolution. Okay, so in a talon, I'm gonna get 80 pulses or 80 counts per revolution, which means my visibility as that thing turns, I have 80 moments of time I've seen it's moved farther in 360 degrees. There is then from across the road, and these, uh, these are wonderful. This is also magnetic. This shaft stacks into the main shaft. It turns this gear. There's a magnet here going into some circuitry. Basically works the same way. It's a quadrature encoder, except it outputs not 20, 
but 1,024 cycles per revolution, or 4,096 edges or counts per revolution. Boy, oh boy, if you're doing position control, suddenly you actually have very, very good resolution on where you go. Also, if you are doing velocity control and you are running this really, really slow, you have a very high tick rate and you have got some bandwidth on figuring out how fast I'm going. If you are going very, very slow on an encoder that has a very slow tick rate and the talent is trying to figure out the speed, it says, okay, here's an edge. Okay, how long till the next edge? It's right here. I must have been going that speed for that next edge to show up. Okay, when's my next speed update? It's when the next edge shows up. I am blind until that next edge or that next red vertical edge shows up. I'm blind on what my speed might be. Now, you look at some of this and say, well, gee, how often do you need to update the speed that fast? On the shooter this year, that was a huge, big deal when you looked at how fast we were trying to recover that wheel. So more counts tend to be better. Okay? Uh, the cross the road encoder does something else that's pretty cool. They also have an absolute output. And this all interfaces very nice to the town. And so the talent actually knows not just the quadrature signal as this thing rotates. The talent can also find out exactly where 0 to 360 degrees is that right now. When you power it on, it's an absolute encoder. We use those on our asthmus. So when you power that thing up, it knows exactly where that wheel is, and you do not have to tell it or put some other switch on it so it can find 0. It just knows. And so depending on your mechanism, having that absolute encoder in there can be cool. Now to use it, that has got to have a ratio to whatever you care about that never rolls over. So when you look at where we have these encoders on our azimuth, they're in the final stage, and the ratio from that shaft to the wheel, the azimuth, is one to one. So one revolution of that is one revolution of the wheel. And now I have an absolute reading of where that wheel is at when I flip the power. That absolute encoder in there is really, really cool. Um, that's also uh, $40 and is what's called a slice you just stack into any of these VEX gearboxes. Now, if you're doing velocity control and you need more pulses, you could stick it earlier in the drivetrain and make it go faster. In the early days, when we were not paying attention, we had it right on the motor and um, whoops. There are some aspects in here where there's a little bit too much friction, and if you stick that on a 15,000 RPM motor, it will melt down. So you got to pay attention how fast it's actually going. It's rated that fast, but there are some frictions with the gears and things. There's a whole process we can show you by which we file things down and put lube in to where you can run them fast if you have to. So that's a watch out for those. But that is a quadrature encoder, high tick rate, with absolute output, and that's cool. This is from US Digital. These have been around first for a long time. This is an optical quadrature encoder. <laughs> Same concept, but it uses a light to look at a disk. Um, there's no absolute on here. Um, and it's sensitive to dirt and grease and all kinds of stuff, and the alignment's pretty critical. The upside is that the magnetic encoders, while you get the correct number of pulses, magnetic fields are not perfect. The exact positioning of those waveforms are distorted a little bit. With an optical encoder, it's very pure. The, the period from this cycle to that cycle to that cycle is exact. With magnetics, it varies just a little bit. You don't lose anything in a revolution. You can kind of think of all the pulses around the wheel, and it's smooshed in some areas and stretched out in some other areas. It's not at a perfect cadence as you go around. For the most part, it won't be an issue for you, but if you need ultra precise of knowing the velocity where there's no jitter in it, then optical might be better. Uh, but you've really got to be pushing the limit on something. So but those are options, and those have been around for a while. The magnetic is way more idiot proof. These are also about 40 bucks and reasonably easy to use as long as you understand the, the watch outs. Um, also, Andy Mark has got a magnetic encoder that stacks on the back of a motor that goes on a gearbox. This is a package they sell. 
That's also cool, relatively inexpensive. They just put it on there. The challenge is it's only seven cycles per rev or 28 counts per rev. Now, you got a big gearbox on it? Okay, that goes around a lot for that output to actually go around and it's probably okay. But if you wanna run this motor pretty slow, if you're doing position control with this, boy, as you approach your answer and this thing is almost stopped, I mean, you have to pack a lunch and wait for the next cycle to show up to have any idea where you're at and what speed you're going. That's, that's at the limit of what you want to do. With magnetics, it is hard to get high pulse rates. The CTR encoder is a very unique technology where you get that killer pulse rate. So that's another quadrature. A potentiometer. Nothing more than a resistor where I have got what's called a wiper that I mechanically can move up and down that resistor. And just like the potentiometer on a stereo, as I turn it, it changes the resistance between those three things. There are what's called continual rotary pots, where in essence, the stop that would stop it at full and stop it at zero doesn't exist. I can go right past 10 and right back to zero and go round, 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 round. The talent is smart enough on those systems to know, okay, I'm at 10 and I immediately went to zero. I didn't go back around, they just crossed the boundary and the talent will figure that out. And so the talent can also interface to these and use them for encoding, this is analog. Um, honestly, I would use something digital unless you've got these laying around and you don't want to spend the money on something else. There's really no upside to this for a rotary encoder uh, versus digital. Yes, it's technically infinite resolution, but it's not real. I would use digital stuff before this. Now, um, interesting application here, though, a string length potentiometer. This is where I want to measure how far something's moved. We used these on the tote bot all over the place because we were moving a lot of things back and forth. It is simply a string and a spring on a rotary potentiometer, and it goes to a particular place and stops, and the talon can read that, and that's how the talon figures out how far that string is out of that thing is I'm unwinding that, I'm turning that potentiometer, and the talent can figure that out. So, for encoders, you've got digital, both magnetic and optical, that are quadrature pulses. You've got several analog that are just resistors. The talent can interface all of this, and you can use that as input, as sensors, when you close loops. And once again, quadrature, string pots, all this stuff is all over the internet. If something wasn't clear, I'd go look at it there. For now, just know those sensors get us the ability to know what position am I right now, what speed am I right now, so the talent has eyes on the system. All right, here we go, shameless plug. We spent quite a bit of time with the different interface boards that are out there, and you can also plug stuff directly into the town. And there's a lot of watchouts and headaches and level shifting, and there was that whole three volt thing on the 1.4 version. And so a number of us are pretty experienced electrical engineers, and the kids on Strike Force were interested in understanding what a real business is like. And so we decided to design up in concert with uh, 141 the robots design up an interface board that was the end-all, be-all, this will do everything you ever need to do and solve all the problems an experienced first team would have and try to have the ultimate answer. And that is the Sentinel interface board. Um, it's very heavily documented. They're available at Andy Mark for 18 bucks. Um, we think pretty highly of it because we designed it and it was intended to be idiot proof. You put this thing on a talon, it's really, really hard to blow up a talon through this thing. You take out an $18 board instead of taking out a $90 talon, then for the most part, that's even pretty hard to do. So this interface is everything, all your signals, and you've also got an option to put these connectors on here, which are these spring-loaded push and down stick the wire in. Great for prototyping. On the comp bot, we would recommend that you actually solder the wires directly to the circuit board, because we've learned I hate connectors, and you should too. Um, the actual production boards have two holes in it, so you can snake the wire in one, down through the other, solder it, and that thing is strain relief. That solder joint sees no force. So it's intended to be an easy to use, low cost solution. You screw it down to the talent, and that's how you interface all these sensors 
and we've tried to make that quite a bit easier. Folks have commented, hey, that board hangs over the end of the town. I don't like how big it is. Well, that white wire and that green wire are coming out that end. The little bit of space that gets used here, you weren't using that for anything else anyway. So we hung the connector off that end so we could have wires and stuff stuck through here and you weren't worried about the connection shorting out to the town. So that also interfaces with the typical 100,000s black uh, looking PWM yep. spacings. Those are 100,000 spacing. You can put whatever connector you might like in there. Those are interesting Wago connectors that are spring loaded and you stick the wires in and you can use them over and over again. So. You've got lights on there to show you the three volt rail, or the 3.3 volt rail, or the five volt rail out of the town. There are lights, uh, as later on you can see down here. As the quadrature runs, those two different quadrature signals, we blink lights. You can see that. The limit switches blink lights. Everything going into this blinks a light. Once again, you now have not just the two town lights, you have all the sentinel lights. And when you're trying to figure out what didn't work in my robot, you move things and look at the lights and say, is this all right? And that's actually saved us a couple of times where we moved something and said, wait a minute, one of the quadrature lights isn't moving. That's not going to work. And you fix the problem. So there's a mock board. There's a couple of other folks that have solutions. I don't think anybody has as comprehensive of a solution as we do. And so that's what we use, and that's why. 